Facebook. It is wonderful to have you with us every week. Whether you realize it or not, we feel your presence and you're a blessing. So I hope that whether you hear this in live time or later this week, that it will be a blessing for you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men, I would add women, are created with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Self-evident. The founders said that life itself entitles us to liberty and freedom to pursue happiness in a society with an even, level playing field. This dream, this vision, springing from a hope that we could improve on the European way of organizing society and government, was a brand new, bold vision of how to live. Though the founders, in fact, were not conventional Christians in the way that the evangelicals claimed they were, many were skeptical about the miracles of Jesus. They were progressives and liberals when it came to faith. But the tree of liberty and all the values that form the compost of our constitutional government come from the soil of faith. The founders believed that God created men and women in such a way that they would thrive best if society affords them freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of participation in government, freedom of public assembly, freedom of dissent, the ability to choose their rulers. The founders believe that as children of God, we should endeavor to make equal opportunity and justice for all a hallmark of our common endeavors. So you can draw a dotted line between the Bible stories of Moses rescuing the Hebrews from bondage and the colonial's pursuit of freedom. You can draw a dotted line from the stories of Jesus that talk about how to treat your neighbor and the framers' concerns about the rights of the poor and the weak. You can draw a dotted line from the prophet's cries for justice throughout the Bible and the founders' rules about due process and fair play. Today, after the service, we will open our history exhibit. We will celebrate this church. We will celebrate the 4th of July one more time here on a Sunday. And it will be tempting to look back with a sense of nostalgia. But history reminds us that often our best days have been times when we looked ahead with vision. Our best times have been times when people in each generation strive to interpret the Founder's vision based on the principles in the Bible for their time and place. So we come together to ask, what does all this mean for us today? In the first place, our country is strongest when we see each person as a gift from God. For four centuries, our nation had a complex mix of races, religions, and class. From the very beginning, Boston was home to aristocrats with Tory leanings and sympathies for the British. At the other end of the spectrum, in every way, Georgia was a penal colony. Africans have lived here for 400 years. Some arrived as early as 1619 as slaves, but there were also free blacks who lived in the colonies in the early 
were among our earliest settlers. The synagogues were established in New York and in Newport, Rhode Island. President George Washington paid an official visit to the Toro Synagogue in Newport in August of 1790. He brought with him Thomas Jefferson, who was then Secretary of State. On this state visit, he said this to the Jewish community gathered. Everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. For happily, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. The citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for giving manhood examples of an enlarged and liberal policy. Everyone who catches a glimpse of this vision is a gift and valuable in God's sight. It was a Jewish poet, Emma Lazarus, who expressed Washington's sentiments so eloquently in her 1903 poem, The New Colossus. Her words have been engraved on the Statue of Liberty. There at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And secondly, we are only as strong as each generation's commitment to these founding principles. Our Constitution wasn't perfect. It had flaws from the very beginning. For the record, they didn't get it all right, let's be clear. Women didn't win the vote for 143 years, well into the 20th century. And the founders condoned the most regressive racial system of indenture in the history of civilization, making African Americans equal to a portion, five-eighths of a white person. They created a labor class with no wages, no rights, no legal status, condemned to pass their servitude on to their offspring, spring in perpetuity. This racial bias at the heart of the democracy made it easy or easier to treat Native people with an equal measure of disdain and distrust, disregard for their lands or rights. But our government and our nation needs people in every generation to call us to our core values. Who better than people of faith? Just decades after the Revolutionary War, it was church people who began to question slavery and start to work for abolition. <coughs> that movement was strong here in New England. In 1839, when slaves took over the Amistad and were arrested, it was congregational churches that raised money to ensure that they would have translators and legal support when they went to trial. The abolitionist movement was strong here in Harwich. On the corner of Bank Street and Miles Road stands a building called Union Hall. It's now apartments 
but on the second floor was an auditorium where there were meetings for abolitionists and large crowds gathered regularly. Anti-slavery conventions were held on Cape Cod throughout the 1800s. At one such meeting on Nantucket, a young former slave named Frederick Douglass was first discovered as he brought the crowd to his feet after he spoke. In 1853, when the people of Harwichport decided to build a church, founders named Doan and Snow made a covenant and agreed that in order to belong to this congregation, you must refuse to own a slave or do business with anyone who owned them. So this church stood for something. Faith here meant something. It was a cause consistent with Christ's admonition to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't think for a minute that those people knew if they were doing the right thing all the time. I don't think for a minute that this was an easy decision for them to make. But these pilgrims of the 1800s kept pushing for justice. They were ordinary people with an extraordinary vision. They had no patience for slavery's cruelty. And they believed that everyone had a responsibility to put their faith into action. And that brings me to my final point. Our country is at its best when we don't tolerate cruelty. The evil Bible and the stories of Jesus are very clear. In his story about a beggar named Lazarus and a rich man with no name at all, Jesus says, when we ignore the beggar at our gate, we make our bed in hell. That story should give us pause today. In Thursday's New York Times, Charles Blow calls out the way our nation has grown more and more accommodated to cruelty. Our government has embraced totalitarian regimes with some of the worst human rights records in the world. And we have often turned a blind eye. For example, no one really has held the government of Saudi Arabia accountable for the death of a columnist from the Washington Post, who was murdered and dismembered in his life. Flo writes, I believe that this indifference speaks to a blindness, or more precisely, an indifference to cruelty. There's an acute indifference to those who suffer. Their suffering is dismissed, and they're written off somehow, something other than us. We write them off as black or brown or female or trans or Muslim or migrant. As people of faith, we have a responsibility to keep our society true to our original ideals and to build a country where kindness and decency prevail. A place where laws restrict cruelty and limit greed a place where we become modern abolitionists, whatever that means. Not those who fight slavery in the past or just become history buffs, but those who strive in every way we can to make life's playing field even, more even than it is. A place where people of color don't get caught in the prison system, a system that's run like a business and fosters recidivism instead of rehabilitation. See, modern abolitionists are people 